gases from binding to your cells. Once you can stop them, they cannot infect you because they need to be inside your cells to infect you. Okay, so from this spike protein structure here, you can see it's binding one human protein here and another one. So if you can design something that will bind to either the human protein or the spike protein here or over here, okay, then you can solve the problem. And that is exactly what has happened. So here, one of these proteins, this is CR5 protein, uh, you can see that red bit inside is a drug. And so it was designed in such a way that it will fit into that groove here that the HIV spike protein will bind to. And this is one of the ways that you can treat uh, HIV. Okay, <clears throat> yes, so I'll just give you a quick, uh, uh, actually I promised the VC that I will not get too technical. Oh, sorry, the chairman, that I will not get too technical. And, uh, but I, I can't afford not to talk about this. Uh, I did this for at least 12 years of my life. I'm sure if I live to be a hundred, uh, that will still be uh, a significant part of my life. But also, X-ray crystallography is not something that is done in Africa. We just don't do it in Africa. And I know some of my former students uh, that are doing their postgraduate studies overseas. Uh, I get calls from them uh, thanking me and uh, for telling them things that are not familiar with over here. And I'm always very proud to get these calls. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, sir, just permit me uh, to... I will not bore the audience too much. Okay, so, uh, to start off with, okay, this is a basic technique that we use. Uh, wherever you are, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know the gene of the protein that you want to uh, determine the structure of. You will clone it into what we call an expression host and then uh, such as bacteria, and then you can grow the bacteria in the lab, loads of it, okay? And so you would expect that it would express your protein. And then you purify your protein from all this uh, bacteria junk, and then you will set up uh, crystallization trials. So the skills that you need for this, for what I've just described, uh, bioinformatics, molecular biology, and biochemistry, okay? Uh, for crystallization, uh, you're forcing the crystals to aggregate, but orderly. Okay, and in my little booklet, I have pictures of uh, crystals in there. Okay, so the skills I require for this are physical chemistry. If you have a good crystal, uh, you can shine x-rays or blast it with x-rays, and they would diffract electrons. And then we get what is called a diffraction data. Uh, from diffraction data to electron density map, uh, you need computer science skills and mathematics skills. And then from the electron density map uh, to getting an atomic model, you need organic chemistry and physics skills. And then once you get the atomic model, uh, you can now get the structure. Uh, and the reason why I think I should also describe this is because uh, you don't have to be in any particular discipline to do this. In the labs that I've worked, uh, in like four or five different countries, uh, we have people that studied agricultural science, doing crystallography, they have some knowledge that's gonna be useful for them. We have people that did microbiology, chemistry, physics, computer science, okay? So uh, it's not limited to anybody. Okay, so thank you, VC, for allowing me to body audience a bit. Now I'm going to start talking about uh, the work that I've done. Uh, for my PhD project, I had to determine the structure of a vaccine candidate. Okay. Uh, for this pathogenic Neisseria, uh, Neisseria gonorrhea, and Neisseria meningitidis. Uh, both organisms are actually very similar, but uh, they cause very different diseases, and that is just an amazing fact. Uh, so the first one, the gonococcus, causes gonorrhea, which is a sexually transmitted disease. Uh, annually, you get about uh, almost 400 million cases, uh, most of them in uh, Africa. Uh, it is not life-threatening, but 
is considered a superbug. It's a, it's a superbug because uh, antibiotics cannot work against it now. Uh, and it's also a major concern now because uh, those that frequently have gonorrhea also have a better chance of uh, contracting the HIV virus. But there are no vaccines. Uh, the meningococcus uh, infects the meninges, which is the membrane that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord, uh, causes bacterial meningitis. Uh, it is a very fatal disease, untreated. 85% of cases die. Uh, if you survive, even with treatment, you can end up with a severe neurological disorders. And there are vaccines, but they're not cheap. Uh, but also, uh, they're not effective against all the different types of the uh, meningococcus. So, uh, this is just uh, to emphasize the fact that it's a major problem for us here because we have what is known as the uh, meningitis belt, uh, which is just uh, this part of Africa. And you can see we're right in the middle of it. Okay, so. Um, I started this work in 2000, as the chairman has told you, and I had to leave the lab in uh, 2004 because they were not going to pay for uh, the project anymore. Uh, but in any case, at that point in time, I could not solve the structure of the, pro of the complex. Uh, and that is uh, because uh, for, uh, for a long time, uh, the consensus has been that these uh, two proteins, TBP and B, are uh, very good vaccine candidates against uh, the uh, pathogen. And the function of these two proteins is to obtain iron from human transferring. Iron is absolutely essential for the survival of this pathogen. In fact, for most living things, including us, without iron, we will suffer. For them, without iron, they will die. So they have to get iron from one of our proteins. So in any case, in 2012, eight years after I left the lab, the structure was finally solved uh, with some of my preliminary data, which was reported in 2004. Uh, so the two proteins, uh, TBPB is on the surface of the cell, and TBPA is stuck inside the membrane of the cell. And you can see we solved the structure in complex with uh, human transferring. Uh, what happens, and there's a sequence to this, this TBPB, you can see it's shaped like that, okay? And then when the cells need iron, TBPB will just start flapping around, okay? And uh, this bit will be flapping around, looking for human transfer. So when it finds it, it will just drag it across and then position it over TBPA. Okay, the ion is bound there, it's this red thing. I don't know if you can see red. Okay, so once this complex is in place, the TBPA protein will then extend this blue thing here and over here as well, and they will disrupt the ion binding site. And then ion will drop into, this is a barrel, okay? And then uh, once it's inside the barrel, this bit in yellow here is in the way. We call it the plug domain. Uh, once it's inside, it will move out of the way, and then iron can then get into the cell. So the whole point of having that plug domain, as far as we're concerned, is that uh, it stops any other thing from just getting in. Okay? Uh, the cells regulate iron uptake, and this is how they do it. So anyway, uh, we have the structure now, so we can start making vaccines, right? No. Uh, there's a problem. And the problem is that uh, even though this big uh, component here, you can make loads of it, because you need to make loads to uh, make vaccines. This A1 here is a problem, and that gave us a problem for about 12 years, because we could not get enough of it to work with. Okay, so some group uh, Can you press the next slide? This is your... Next slide, please. Okay. Maybe you will come back.
Go back, okay. Go back to, uh, go back. Yes, up here. Sorry about that. Okay, so, um, so this group, what they have done is uh, to circumvent this problem. Remember I told you that this blue thing here and this loop, they're important for ion uptake. What they have done is they have engineered these two bits here, okay, into TBPB, and it looks like this. And this hybrid protein can uh, protect lab animals against uh, um, infection. So it remains to be seen if uh, it can be transmitted to humans that way. So, right. Uh, this uh, project here was actually done in collaboration with, uh, uh, when I was at St. Andrews. Can you mute it? You can't mute it. Okay. Yes. Um, so yes, this project was done in collaboration with a collaborator from Malaysia. Uh, they told us about these tropical frogs, uh, that uh, they are nests, uh, they are free from microorganisms, and their nests are in the jungle somewhere, you know, so you can imagine, you can just imagine if you have a pond behind here, and you have frogs mating, uh, you would think that, you know, microorganisms would just be streaming all around there, but that's not the case. So there's something about this uh, foam, okay, that uh, keeps uh, microbes out. And so we thought, okay, let's get some of this foam and, you know, identify some of the antimicrobial compounds, okay? So you can see, this is how they actually make the uh, foam. Uh, the male uh, sits on top of the female, and there's a sequence to this. Uh, if you miss it, they are not going to make babies, okay? And then the female releases uh, this protein fluid and eggs. And then the male will release the sperm. And then both of them will mix it together uh, by doing that crazy thing with their legs. They whip it up into the foam. So they make the foams themselves, okay? So can we go to the next slide? Right, so I took uh, uh, some of this foam and uh, took it to the lab. And after 48 hours, uh, you can see it started to change color. It's blue now. Uh, those white things, those white things that you see there are the eggs. So this is the, like their womb, you know, if you like. Uh, so I just took some of this, removed the eggs, spun it down, and uh, set up some crystallization trials. Uh, you can see the crystals are even blue, okay, and then eventually solve the structure, uh, which we call Rana's morphin. So, the bad news first. All the experiments I did with this protein uh, could not kill any um, bacteria, okay? But I've already seen something interesting. Blue, the color blue is not something that you see in nature. Uh, you can see green, you can see red, but you know, they are pigments, chlorophyll, etc. They do this. But uh, blue is not something that you see in nature. So, um, so I thought, okay, well, this is not something that uh, you see in nature, so it's going to be publishable anyway. Uh, so the, uh, the blue color actually comes from this unusual cross links that we see on top here. Okay, I've just brought them out here for you to see. Okay, and nothing like this had ever been seen in any protein. It was the first time. So the experiments that I did showed that uh, this protein protects the foam from UV radiation. Remember, they have their babies in there. Okay, so they have to do everything to protect their babies. But also, this foam stays together, okay, for a long time. So if you observe nature, and you've been near a pond and you see foam floating along, that is the nest, and uh, it is very stable, okay? And it appears that this protein also uh, makes it very stable. Okay, so the next project that I'm talking about is uh, one that I worked on at St. Andrews uh, uh, before I went to Saudi Arabia. Um, at this point in time, 
This was uh, after September 11th and uh, July 7th. Uh, uh, bombings in London, incidentally, I think the chairman actually said that. Incidentally, today is the 15th anniversary. Uh, but it was so easy to get funding uh, to uh, study uh, biological uh, weapons. Uh, so just to give you an idea, uh, the most dangerous are up here and the least dangerous uh, are down there. But they're still dangerous nonetheless. Uh, biological weapons are extremely, extremely terrible uh, to handle and deal with. If you uh, have conventional weapons, uh, somebody drops a bomb, we would all know, we are all going to take shelter. For biological weapons, there's no need for bombs. Uh, I can just come with a test tube, with my uh, organisms, and just spill a bit around, and then stroll outside. And then uh, people will just start uh, getting sick, or even worse, start dying. So um, the worry for the Western government was that uh, some rogue individual or uh, organization or even country can uh, start to develop something like this. So they want antidotes ready, just in case. Like I said, money was available, so I just wrote a proposal and they said no. You cannot walk on a smallpox. I said, okay, fine, I'll go look for something that is similar to smallpox. Uh, that does not even affect any human beings. And uh, that organism, or that virus, is uh, this virus here, so Folobus aslandicus. Uh, like I said, it does not affect human beings. In fact, it affects organisms that, are, that strive at a high temperature and acidic pH. Uh, so they are not things it's not a problem for us at all. But the reason why I chose it is because it is very similar to the smallpox virus in terms of the genomic organization and some of the uh, proteins in there. So in any case, I, uh, and nobody knows anything about this virus anyway, so I think I'll be uh, uh, killing uh, two birds with one stone, if you like. So uh, one of the structures that I solved, I eventually determined to be a protein responsible for DNA replication which I told you earlier, is an important uh, process. So it's important for both viruses. Uh, so uh, what this structure shows is that uh, you have two subunits joined together. The same thing, one is green, one is yellow, and the active sites are there. And uh, the active site, this stick thing here, is uh, DNA. So we solved the structure and complex with DNA, and we could show that DNA can bind to the active site. Okay, and uh, yes. But what was interesting, uh, I proposed a model for the replication, uh, and that is because you have two active sites here. So this one can cut here, and this one can also cut and join over there. Okay, so uh, I should also mention uh, that uh, even though I published the work in 2011, I brought the project to Fountain University and I gave it to my undergraduate students. And they were actually able to do some further studies on it, including identifying viruses uh, that also use this kind of protein for, for their replication. Okay, so another project that I worked on uh, was on uh, arsenic. Arsenic is uh, one of the most toxic elements uh, on the planet. Uh, in some places, you have uh, high levels of arsenic in drinking water, seafood, and uh, for those of us that mine for heavy metals like gold, etc., you release arsenic into the environment. Uh, when it gets into us, you can have uh, some of these pathologies here. Uh, cancer. Cancer happens frequently, uh, but the most uh, frequent thing that you will see is hyperkeratosis, which is you have a uh, scaling of the skin. Uh, this is very common actually in Southeast Asia, uh, Bangladesh, etc., Sri Lanka. And so, um, well, it turns out that. Uh, some bacteria can actually make arsenic less toxic, okay? Uh, so, 
This compound arsenic okay, can be converted to arsenate by uh, these two enzymes that are produced by this bacterium, Rhizobium NT26. So Rhizobium NT26 is a bacterium that you find most frequently uh, close to uh, gold mines. Okay, so I solved the structure of the uh, complex. That's the A component there, that's the B component there. And it turns out that uh, if you uh, want to design biosensors, uh, biosensors are things like uh, you have a strip and you stick it into uh, some liquid, you can change color. Uh, we don't need the whole complex. All we need is just uh, the active site, which I've put in the circle here. So we designed uh, something and put it onto a carbon scaffolding and stuck all this on it. And uh, it did not survive high temperatures, unfortunately. Uh, but I know that they are research called uh, 5 oxoproline uh, High levels of 5 oxoproline uh, can result in uh, neurodegenerative disorders, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, etc. Uh, it can also lead to anemia. Well, it turns out that some bacteria can detoxify this uh, using this uh, protein complex. And the pathway is uh, outlined here. Uh, PXPB converts 5-oxoproline to phosphorylated 5-oxoproline. C converts it to gamma glutamine phosphate. And then A converts it to L-glutamate. So I, which is good actually. L-glutamate is good for us. It's an amino acid. Okay, but uh, this one here, here, and here, they're toxic. Okay, so. Uh, I wanted to solve the structure of this complex, but I could not. Uh, and I ended up solving the structure of uh, just the A component. So uh, as a project for my postgraduate students at Fountain University, I uh, just wanted to keep them out of my way, keep them busy. I told them, let's go and find the function of this protein uh, using bioinformatics. And uh, what we found out was that uh, PXPA, in the absence of a substrate, has this tunnel. And when it has something bound to it, it closes up. Okay, so that suggests that uh, the protein is trying to sequester the toxic metabolite from the environment. So we proposed a model uh, that actually the whole complex would form a tunnel whereby all the toxic metabolites would be passing through that tunnel until when it gets to the end. Uh, proposed the model and then published it. And then started praying hard because uh, scientists are very brutal people. If you propose anything that does not make sense, they will come at you. Uh, one of the most famous microbiologists uh, proposed that we could use chloroquine uh, to treat uh, COVID-19. I'm telling you now that uh, his life is miserable. Uh, I don't think anybody will want him at a conference. He's still going to remain a professor. He has done more, than, more good than bad. Okay, so, uh, well, a month ago, I got an alert. Uh, not the kind of alert that my wife likes to hear. But, uh, the, from email, ResearchGate, that uh, this paper has been cited. And I can guarantee you, I almost suffered a cardiac arrest. Because citation could mean, what are you talking about? You know, this is complete nonsense. But first thing, they actually solved the structure of the whole complex. First. Secondly, they then referenced my paper and said, as proposed by, and I did a dance, all by myself. <laughs> it was at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, and I was in a show group, yeah, so I did my dance myself. I danced properly, uh, yes, because that was the first citation, and it was a lot of hand waving uh, going on, because I only had one thought of it, you know, but I just thought, it must be, it must be. So if you know anything, and you think, you know, people are gonna say you're foolish, say it anyway, uh, worst thing is they'll say you're foolish. But in this case, I've been vindicated. 
And I think uh, I can actually be proud to say I'm a professor uh, based on that. And my students as well, actually, because they did most of the work. So, um, yes, uh, when I uh, became a professor, the chairman called me and said, come on, uh, congratulations. It's not the one that you now start uh, doing your go up and down campus. Uh -huh. um, you have to work, because this is when we're going to start judging you. Uh, what can you profess? We don't want your previous history, we want something for the future. So, uh, well actually that's what I was planning to do, but you know, I had to change my plans. Uh, and I had to start thinking of a research project. My students, if they're here, will tell you that I love viruses. Uh, viruses are very simple to work with. Uh, they just have uh, the genetic material and they have a protein shell. They don't have to worry about uh, mating with anybody, finding a suitable partner. They just want to get into your cells and multiply, finish. So I love them for that. Uh, all living things are susceptible to viruses, uh, which means that we cannot escape them. Uh, but look at this. Uh, there are more viruses in the ocean alone than there are um, stars in the sky. At least as far as we can see. And they talk about billions and billions. Uh, and that's just in the oceans. What about on Earth? You know, sorry, uh, on us and uh, other living things. And uh, yes, I did not know a lot about viruses uh, until when I was invited to write uh, an article to uh, do a meta-analysis on what we know about life, uh, living things, the basic processes, DNA replication. And I actually found out that uh, most of what we know about living things actually come from studies uh, done with viruses. Okay, so. Uh, I think, uh, well, I think the chairman has promised me a lot of money uh, to do this research now, so we have to hold him accountable. Okay, so uh, we've been talking about health matters, and uh, I know that uh, it is very easy for us to say we're celebrating something today. Yes, we are. But I think at the same time, I have very important people in this room. Uh, academia, uh, people in industry, uh, leaders uh, of uh, all uh, walks of life. And I think we have to be honest with ourselves. I want to share two stories with you. Uh, and this is the first one. Uh, this uh, title, The Boy on the Bucket, uh, I got it from a newspaper article uh, at the height of the Ebola uh, crisis. And uh, the reporter said uh, on August 18th, uh, residents of uh, West Point, Monrovia, they went to ransack a, an Ebola holding center. Uh, they were just keeping the suspected victims, uh, sorry, uh, patients in this place. And the residents got angry and said, why are you keeping people here? He didn't even tell us. And they went and chased everybody out at night. The next morning, uh, August 19th, this boy was found sitting on the beach somewhere on a bucket. And he was sitting there for hours. And as we do, people were just surrounding him and looking at him. They knew the boy was sick for hours. And uh, I went to the comment section. I think you can still find videos of this online. I went to the comment section and I said, no child deserves this. But somebody actually had a better response. Uh, no human being deserves this, full stop, period, full stop. Well, the story continues. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, in the evening, they got tired of looking at him and they made him a makeshift bed. They gave him some clothes to wear and they gave him a something to sleep on. As is, yes. yes. And the next day he died. Yes, I, I don't need your sympathy. Um, I don't think he's dead now. 
We don't need any sympathy. We need to start thinking about uh, what really matters to us. Uh, I understand that Nigeria, like uh, most countries on this planet, have signed up to the international health regulations by the uh, World Health Organization. That we will do everything possible to uh, protect our citizens when it comes to health matters. So uh, we will do everything possible to develop uh, treatments, facilities for infectious diseases, respond to crisis, assess our response, and then report it. And I, I read it, I only read it recently because of this. You don't actually have to do everything yourself. You can do a partnership with neighboring countries and say, why don't we have the lab for this in this country and for that in that country, and they will train people. And when you do things like that, you will get money. It's easy to get money. Okay, if you're serious about uh, um, science, it is easy. You just have to show commitment to do it. So, uh, the other story, did I change it? Okay, go to the next one. Just to wrap it up. Uh, I went to a seminar when I was a postgraduate student. Uh, nothing to do with my work. I was just bored. So let me go and learn something here. And one of the speakers was about um, public health. And one of the speakers uh, uh, was talking about uh, uh, Bernard Shaw. For those of you that did literature, uh, he won a Nobel Prize in literature some years back. He's a poet, etc. And uh, at some point in time, he got into politics. And he was uh, campaigning for office in London uh, as a councillor. And he was campaigning. Just look at these years when he was alive. He was campaigning that uh, all houses for poor people would uh, have bathrooms. Bathrooms installed in them. That's just to tell you that uh, you know, London, uh, London wasn't always fancy. As in, and look at the years we're talking about. And the opposition told him, listen, why are you worrying yourself? Poor people don't have their bath. You know, they'll go and store meat and fish inside it. You know, they'll think it's a big cooler or something, you know. And he said, no, I, uh, I'm not worried about them having a bath for their sake. It is for my sake. Because infectious diseases, like I told you at the beginning, yeah, yes, and he's a rich man. He's going to have a driver, he's going to have cleaner, he's going to have cook. They're going to come into your house. So, and this stuck in my head. And uh, every time I have an opportunity to use it, uh, I always try and use it. Because I think uh, the VC was asking me what inspires you. And I think I've just told you uh, two stories that inspire me to continue to work. Uh, uh, and uh, I hope that uh, this can also be replicated. Uh, even if it's just one person that listens and pays attention, it is still something. Yes, so, um, now for the acknowledgement. Uh, I really, really humbly want to thank the uh, Vice Chancellor. Uh, if you read my little booklet, you will see how he just bullied me into uh, doing this. Uh, but it's a good thing. It's a good thing because I had to uh, do something that I wasn't comfortable with. And uh, so you need somebody to do things like this. And he organized this whole show. So, uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, we also have the inaugural lectures committee, uh, headed by Dr. Raji, uh, who also assisted the VC uh, to put this show together. I say thank you very much. Uh, yes, I, I'm in a department, and I think they've tolerated me for a long time. Uh, yes, and they allowed me to actually uh, uh, prepare for this. So, uh, and I didn't have to make any uh, departmental duties. So I want to thank my HOD. I know she's there somewhere. Dr. Jimo uh, and other members of the department. We're so many, I can't start naming uh, all of us. Uh, 
Uh, yes, the work I've described, of course, I didn't do it alone. Uh, uh, my PhD advisor, Susan Buchanan, uh, one of the best people I can uh, think of. I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, when I was, uh, when we got the award, okay, you can now, I got a grant to do my PhD. Uh, we were now working in the lab for about three months. At uh, eight o'clock in the morning, uh, we were there together. And uh, one of the other lecturers called and said, listen, uh, I could overhear the conversation. I wasn't eavesdropping, but it wasn't too far off. And, uh, and the man was asking her, you know, uh, okay, listen, we, we're going to, we're thinking of taking on this black student. And uh, we don't know, what do you think about it? And she said, she looked at him and she said, seriously? Are you asking me that question? And that for me, just uh, made me understand that uh, there are people, and there are people. You know, and she walked off. I, I don't know, she just walked out of the lab. You know, I didn't see her for about half the day. You know, I knew she was very upset. And, uh, but that said a lot. She took me to the United States. Uh, from London, she got my scholarship for me and she took me to the United States. Uh, so, uh, Rob Evans was my co supervisor at King's College, was an elderly man, very nice man to work with. Jim Naismith was a young guy, he's one of the most famous crystallographers on this planet, period. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's also a very, very difficult person to work with, but I was with him for about seven years. So, uh, Fountain ain't seen nothing yet. I'm not even starting. Nina Fedorov, Nina Fedorov, uh, I met Nina Fedorov, she was a professor emerita uh, in Saudi Arabia, and her salary was just ridiculous, you know, millions of dollars. Uh, the woman is bent over now, you know, well then she was even bent over. And you would see her riding a bicycle in the hot sun in Saudi Arabia. She was 73 years old. Uh, and she was still working, and she was still collecting all this uh, major salary. But uh, this woman, uh, she, uh, she's what you would call a classic boss. So you can't just go up to her and say, I want to do this project. You're like, okay, yes, so what is your hypothesis? You did not think about that. You know why you wanted to do it, but she will frame it in such a way that uh, you can't just come and tell her something else. But I'll tell you a quick story about her. She was going to Egypt uh, to go and present. We were doing uh, desert agriculture. And she was going to Egypt to present to President Morsi. And uh, she came to practice in the lab. And I, I told her, uh, you know, we were just in the lab. And I told her, Nina, you're wrong. That is not. And she stopped. She goes, what? Uh, yes, you're wrong. This is something that she published over 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Uh, and I told her, you're wrong. She said, but it's my work. I said, no, I've read your books. I've read your papers like it's my Bible. I know everything inside. And she said, okay, I'll check it out. And then she went, and when she came back, at the first lab meeting, she said, listen, uh, I want to thank Dr. Musio Care for, for this. Uh, because I would have gone there to embarrass myself because some of my former students were in the audience. Uh, yes, uh, because she travels everywhere. Okay, so me, uh, just a new person in the lab. Listen, I've, I've talked about all the principal investigators. Uh, my lab colleagues over the years, they made lab fun. We always got into trouble together. And uh, we always found our way out of trouble together. Uh, my colleagues at Fountain University, uh, staff students, uh, the only reason why I really enjoy Fountain University is the students. You always get variety, and then uh, they always bring you something that you can't even imagine. And that is the beauty of being a teacher, because you also learn from them. All these people have uh, provided me with money. In case they're watching, I'm thanking you. Uh, you can also give me money tomorrow, uh, the, besides the one that uh, the VC is going to give me. And then my family, listen, uh, you know, it's so easy to say you have to appreciate your family. Uh, they're the reason why I behave myself. 
Uh, I'm not easy. I'm not easy to work with uh, because I only have one straight path. And uh, I don't want too much distraction. And the uh, cameraman is laughing. <laughs> yes, because they know me very well. Yes, uh, but my family, uh, my kids, Abdurrahman cannot make it uh, today uh, because he's, uh, he's doing something more important in school. I don't know what that is. When I showed him the title, he said, what does this mean? Uh, this is nonsense, yes. I'm going, I'm going to school, you know. If you come and tell me after what you, yes. And he told his siblings, come and tell me after what, uh, yes. Yes, my mom cannot make it today. Uh, but uh, I have our sisters here with me and the other members of my family. And of course, oh, don't clap yet. Because uh, I have to talk about the love of my life. Yes, we, we, we don't even know how we uh, get along, but they're just two opposites. Uh, she has her own idea of life, I have my own idea of life. And uh, I guess, you know, like the chemist would say, opposites attract. And uh, I think that is the case. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. that I think we have all enjoyed his expertise. Another round of applause for him, please. Well, I just need to give a vote of thanks now. And uh, as I did at the beginning, we want to thank the executive governor of the state of Fashon, the state of uh, many Muri Gas, our head of service. Thank you very much for helping the governor. Uh, also, we want to appreciate uh, all our fathers, our royal fathers here. When the RPG of the RPG has been a friend of the house. Can you see our welcome, sir? And of course, we have the honor of us here as well. We have the, uh, uh, the Alagba of Alagba Land. Can you see, sir? We also have the uh, Ororuo. Uh, the above for rural land, yeah. Can you see? You know, the can see is also an alpha, it's Ustaz. He didn't bring his uh, turban today, you will have known him better. Can you see? I welcome, sir. And also, we have the can see of Adda, I think. Can you see? I welcome, sir. Now, I want to appreciate some of our senior colleagues in the field. The uh, Professor M. O. Okwaloye. Is a member of uh, the Foundry University of Development Foundation. Professor Kolo here, you are welcome, sir. And it's also representing the KBC, the ONU of uh, IFE. And I want to tell you something. Uh, I want to bring this news to you that very shortly, we are going to invite our royal fathers again. The ONU of IFE has just endowed a center to the university. And I'm going to invite you all very shortly. The chairman of Hospital, Justice Kole uh, Ade Yuge, very supportive, you are welcome. The Vice Chancellor, uh, Adelife University, is a friend of the house, Professor Adebola, I saw him earlier today. Prof, you are welcome. He's our good friend. Vice, uh, the, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor at Hickman University, Professor Akashaw, you are welcome. The Vice Chancellor of the University of Abuja, ably represented by one of his best house. Personala, so you are welcome. Huh? Our proprietors, I think I mentioned earlier on, from the chairman of the BOT, 
Chief Commissioner, our Port Chancellor, Alai Sheriff Yusuf, Baba Officer Pelo, and all others, Professor Adisa, I think I saw her sometimes. That's the latest professor in town. You are welcome back. I used to call out my employer, who is a member of the University Government Council. All the members of the Government Council are here. Uh, Alaji Aide is here. Professor Adibola, yes, VP2. You are welcome. Alaji Marufa Ajiroba, Imam Alaya, Zonal Mishana, Alaji Yusuf Gambari. Yes, the, the most powerful secretary in the whole world, in Kayaya, and the secretary. The Secretary P.O.T., you are welcome. And of course, the Vice Chancellor of Bowen University, ably represented by Dr. I can't remember what the name now. Any uh, uh, Bowen universities, they are represented as well. And some other universities are here. If I didn't mention your name, it's not out of uh, disrespect. I want to thank you all for this, and I appreciate you. And uh, inshallah, the next edition is coming very shortly, and of course, our distinguished lectures, lecture series is also coming very shortly. We've invited lecturers from Harvard University, from Texas, and of course from Edinburgh. The next one is coming from the United States, inshallah. So we hope to see you then, inshallah. And uh, let me now invite the lecturer to keep the uh, closing as an assembly. We remain said we allow the procession to go out and receive, and then we can then uh, live so. Register, please. Could you have you? The procession will receive the call in the reverse order. Thank you very much for coming. Audu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Namazullah. Wa nazaluhi. Wa nazakbiruna. We thank you, Almighty Allah. We praise you, Almighty Allah. We salute you, Almighty Allah. We appreciate you, Almighty Allah, who has made today's event possible. There is nothing you can do for you except to say, Alhamdulillah, you are ready to be We pray, and Almighty Allah, so we turn all of us back to our destination safely. May Allah continue to make fancy in your place of your strength and strength.